Welcome back fellow adventurers to a brand new video and today Professor Ben or Ben Barsh is back teaching you Swords and Wizardry. Now this is section two of Swords and Wizardry 101 where I go through Swords and Wizardry complete rulebook and teach you how to play the game. If you missed the last video, click the card above. It's the little eye in the top right corner and you can catch up that way. In that one I began talking about character creation and this one I'm gonna continue it talking about classes and whatever else we reach in this episode. Now I don't wanna make the episodes like hours long because I kinda wanna make this a series that evolves over time. Also, in the last video, I really, really enjoyed the interaction and comments that I got. I said that if you want me to go over something in the comment section, please, or go over something in more detail in the book, leave it in the comment section. And I got a couple requests, so I'm gonna be hitting those in detail as they come along in the series. But if there is something that you would like me to go more in depth on, please comment it and I will go in depth on it, or I will make a completely separate video talking about it if it is deemed necessary. You can get the Swords and Wizardry PDF for free on the Frog God Games website. All you have to do is go to the top of the video description and click on the link. You can download that for absolutely free. You can tip whatever amount you would like. Obviously, a tip is kind of recommended. But if you want to pick up the hardcover book, then you can get that for $35 and follow along at home. And that gives you the complete rule book. It gives you everything you need as a player and then the, uh, the game master referee as well. So you don't have to be buying a bunch of separate books or anything like that. Please leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it anytime. It really, really helps me grow the channel and subscribe if you have not subscribed already because at 1,000 subscribers, I am going to be doing a giveaway and once we get closer to that, I will be announcing you know, what I'm giving away and how to enter and all that kind of good stuff. Without further ado, let's get into section two of Swords and Wizardry 101. Okay, now we are in the PDF. I would like to take a moment real quick to talk about some um, broad specifics. Um, first of all, I want to... Today, in today's video, I want to go over um, races, actually, before I talk about classes. However, b before we jump into the races, I want to just give up you examples of what each class is uh, and just talk about them real quick. So fighters are just fearsome warriors, basically. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be going kind of this quick on them. Magic users are mages, so they're going to use uh, magic um, to sort of destroy or enchant their enemies, stuff like that. Um, you know, your basic spellcasters. Monks are... Um, Basically, hand-to-hand um, -hand combat fighters that um, sort of seek physical, spiritual, um, mental enlightenment um, to empower everything that they do. Um, they're often um, very similar to fighters, um, but can use uh, fighting without weapons. So, you know, they're kind of like, uh, they're monks. Uh, <laughs> you know, like kung fu masters, uh, kind of how I explain it to new people um, that maybe haven't experienced it before. Uh, paladins, next up. Um, paladins are uh, knights of holy light, um, so they're very similar to fighters. However, they do get some healing, some spells, that kind of stuff. Paladins um, are often tied to specifically chaos or uh, law, so you either are really defending the law of the land and the people, or you're pretty much you know fighting exclusively against it <laughs> so they can be kind of fun um rangers um are basically uh wilderness people <laughs> or the you know they're roamers um travelers uh they are very very often out in the wild as opposed to in the city you very rarely see a ranger hanging out inside of a city if you do see them in a city sometimes they are you know um giving advice to kings queens lords ladies um, on, on battle. Um, but generally they're like the protectors of the weak. Um, they try to stay more in the shadows, um, and, and work from the shadows, uh, sort of be like a driving force. Uh, that is, um, a soft voice that, uh, has a booming effect. Um, and they're very good at tracking and anything survival in nature. That's a very important note for Rangers. Very, very good at, uh, anything in the wilderness there. That's where they thrive. Thieves, exactly what you would think <laughs> they they're they're thieves um you know they use subtlety um to expose their enemies and i think i skipped over druid somehow in there um let's go back real quick but i wanted to talk specifically i i skipped a couple i don't know why i started at fighter <laughs> <laughs> Going back up, um, there's assassin um, who are a, a subclass of thieves um, that can use poisons um, instead of just specifically like cloak and dagger. Uh, clerics are uh, priests or priestesses that are uh, warriors as well um, that as well serve law or chaos that choose a patron to um, study and get your powers from. 
Uh, Druids are basically the the front line in protecting nature. Um, they often are very good friends with the, um, the the wild, so they're very much in tune with the earth and uh, the animals around it. You know, basically uh, friends of the forest is what I usually say, or you know, um, you know, whatever location that they're defending as the, as a druid. So now that we have a little bit of an idea of what the classes are, don't worry. In, in next video, I'm going to go through them more specifically. I just wanted to have everyone have sort of like baseline knowledge of them before I jump into races. I generally, when I'm teaching new games, I start with races. Um, I like people to pick their race before their class because I really want them to get into their character. And I think a very important thing to get into your character is really piece, picking a, a race that you vibe with, for, for lack of a better term. Um, so... Uh, while I go through the races and talk about the mechanical aspects of them, I, I'm also going to give you um, a little bit of description on what each are. Now, of course, a lot of people watching this video, you already know what a dwarf is. You know the basics of a dwarf. However, I want to go out of my way for the people that, um, you know, maybe haven't had as much exposure to fantasy games or fantasy the fantasy genre in general, um, just to make sure that they're getting all the knowledge that they could possibly get from this video. So another thing I want to talk about real quick is it's possible that say you say, say you were listening to my list and you thought, wow, fighter sounds really cool, and you play fighter for a couple levels. But then you're going through and you really just don't like fighter as much as you thought you would, and your friend who's playing the thief, you really think thief is awesome. So you get up to fighter level four and you say, you know what, I'm, I'm kind of sick of being a fighter. I want to be a thief. Instead of re-rolling your character or making a new character, you can dual class. Um, and that's what this box here is explaining. Um, the dual classing is basically when you say, I'm kind of fed up with playing this, let's switch to this other thing. So as rules is written, uh, you have to have a minimum attribute score of 16 for the prime attribute of the new class. So dexterity is prime for thief, so we would have to have at least a 16 in our dexterity. Now if you don't, maybe you can work with your referee or, or game master to uh, maybe do some side quests that you raise your dexterity. Uh, maybe you just spend like a month with a thieves guild or something like that, improving on those abilities. Um, I, I personally don't like saying no as a referee or a dungeon master, game master, or whatever you want to call it, but I will work with my players to get to where they want to be. Sometimes they're going to have to earn that though. Um, so say you, you know, go thief. The problem with advancement, so you're, you're level four as a fighter, right? Your next level, you want to be a level one thief. The problem with advancement, and this will all make a little bit more sense as you know, we go through this, it only takes like 2,000 experience to get to a level, or no, it, ta it takes 1,250 experience to get to, um, well, zero experience, <laughs> but if you're going to get to level one uh, or two, um, it's, you know, 1,250 experience. See, that's not a lot of experience for a level four. Um, you're going to get that really quickly. So um, an option in the book is, say, um, we'll switch to level five because that's what the example is in the book. Say you are a level five fighter. We've been saying fighter um, or magic user. Take whatever experience that you get and divide it by five. So you're going to divide it by your level. And then once you reach 1,250 experience, you know, to get that first level there, that's when you are able to go up. So divide all your experience by your current level of whatever you are playing in order to get to that experience. Or this is what I do in my games. Um, now, p people who play 5th edition will um, you know, notice that this is dr you know, pulled right out of, of 5e Dungeons and Dragons. Say we are a level 4 fighter and we really want to be a thief. You see how from level 4 to 5 or to be level five, you need 10,000 experience. I would argue that to become a thief, you need that 10,000 experience. You know, a lot of people don't agree with this, um, but I also, I, I do think that it can be beneficial to go for the normal experience that you would have for going up to that next level. Um, that way you don't deal with the dividing or anything like that. Um, and you just take your experience just raw. Um, it can be a little confusing because you need 10,000 experience, but then that only puts you back at level one. Um, so you're like kind of hop skipping around. So just pick whatever one that you think is most viable. Um, also note that you will cap out at nine hit dice, no matter what uh, levels you gain. 
So that means you will not be able to roll for your health past like level nine. Um, you're just going to get like one hit point per. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to point out dual classing real quick because it's different than multi classing, and that's going to come up as we start right now with races. <laughs> We're finally to races. Yes, um, after like eight minutes. Sorry for rambling for so long. I just want to make sure that we get as much of the basic information out of the way as possible, so we can get talking about uh, the races and everything makes sense. So I don't have to dive around now. All right. So dwarves are, uh, you know, uh, as you see in the picture here, they're sort of like, uh, they're, they're small stocky, um, generally pretty strong. Uh, they're very hardy. They're very brave. They care about their honor a lot and they care about their family, their tribe a lot. They're very loyal people. Dwarves are loyal to a fault, um, at some points. They're generally uh, found in like mountain halls or mines, um, with settlements that are kind of exclusively dwarf. Um, most dwarven settlements uh, are, are pretty exclusively dwarf. Um, and that kind of goes for the same for any of the other non-human um, races that you're going to find. So dwarves get a plus four on saving throw against magic and easily take note to features of stonework. So like corridors, moving walls, traps, um, or you know anything that has to do with stone, you can easily identify the, the nature of the stonework so if it's recent or not you know kind of maybe where it came from if you're familiar with the region sorry excuse me if you're familiar with the regions uh they can see in the dark they can see up to 60 feet because of dark vision there okay this is why i want to talk about race before i talk about class dwarven players must be fighters or fighter thieves now you see fighter thieves there you say oh ben that's really cool they can only dual class fighter thieves wrong they can be a fighter thief from first level with multi-classing and I'll get into that more a little bit later you can multi-class a fighter thief right away multi-class fighter thieves are limited to six levels of fighters and may not advance beyond this point for more information on multi-class so, so on and so forth go on I would argue from that point you can advance as many as you want as a thief but if you have a cool referee maybe you can go a little bit higher as a fighter a dwarf who is purely a fighter may advance to six level only if the warrior has the strength of Oh, may advance beyond 6th level, sorry. If the warrior has strength of 17, that makes them 7th level or 18, they can be 8th level. So from there, you cannot be a fighter no more. That's when you can uh, dual class if you do that multi-class right out of the gate. Uh, such a, a fighter, uh, you know, you, you get more experience based on your strength. Cool. So, dwarves can be fighters or thieves. So if you if, if you if you when I was going through those those uh, classes real quick and you thought oh wow fighter and a thief sound cool to me maybe dwarf is 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 what you want to do real quick continued advancement non human characters are limited in advancement in their class however if you have a referee that says well let let's let them advance I want to play a really high level campaign I want all my characters to get to like level twenty have them advance a little slower and the reason why is because non-humans get these really cool abilities like plus four on saving throws and you get dark vision and stuff. Humans aren't so lucky. Humans are pretty baseline. <laughs> they don't really get anything. Their, their nice part is they can be a bunch of different classes than non-humans can. So if you, want, if you are allowing them to advance past whatever level cap that they may have, consider giving them a um, experience, um, you know, like a stifle to their, ingre or their, their ingredients, experience rather. So moving on to elves. Elves are more elegant. They are quite almost the opposite of dwarves. <laughs> um, they're taller, slender figures, more dexterous and more mindful. They often think more with their minds than they do their hearts. Dwarves really think with their hearts and act more off impulses. Elves are way more methodical and generally are can be a little bit more selfish um and more they more have a sort of a preservation mentality than dwarves do so elves uh can see in the dark as well this is their cool ability they have a four and six chance to find secret doors when searching unlike the other races so they can find secret stuff awesome, like awesome, very easily <laughs> um everyone else has a two and six so you know double basically uh Elves also have a 1 in 6 chance to notice a secret door when they are not searching at all. Say they're just walking down a corridor. This is for you, referees. Say they're walking down a corridor and they pass a secret door, but they said they never said that they were searching for it. That's when you roll a d6. Say you roll that 1. Then you say, oh, wow, elf, 
you walked past the secret door and just as you were about to go past it, you noticed the mechanism. So sometimes they can even find it without searching and they cannot be paralyzed by ghouls. That's huge. Ghouls are nasty, nasty monsters and the ability uh, to negate the ghouls like nasty ability, which is paralyzation is pretty big. Elven players can be fighters, fighter slash magic users, thieves exclusively, or fire magic users, thieves. My favorite class in the game, class race combination since I started playing, has either been fighter magic user elf. I, I've I've loved it. I still play it to this day. No matter what edition I play, I find a way to multi class it or to make it work. Or I play human ranger. That's that's besides the point. I played a human ranger when I was uh, young. I was playing solo adventures because rangers were one of the only classes that stood a chance for any of the OGs listening. Um, so I played human ranger or I played. Um, elven fighter magic user i have so much fun with this class um i think it's really cool to have the ability to fight up in combat and then back up and use some spells i just i really do enjoy it um an elf that is solely a thief may uh advance with no level limit so thieves can go on for forever as elves um so keep that in mind if you're thinking thinking about making a thief um or if you're making an elf maybe that's just an option for you um, elves advancing in more than one class are limited to fourth level as a fighter, and then if you have higher strength, you, may, you can go a little higher. Eighth level is magic user, and then you can go a little bit higher if you have a higher intelligence. So you know that that's pretty a basic theme going on here. So if you're a thief, you can go on forever, and then fighter magic users, fighter magic users, thieves are going to have those restrictions for you. Um, but if you're multi-classing it, you're basically you know say you get capped out at fourth level. You get the lowest, and then you get capped out at 8th level. You're basically level 12, so you're making it really high anyway. Um, not often in, in sort of these old-school-esque games do characters make it super high anyway. Um, half-elves, yay. Half-elves are half-elf, half-human. Half-elf. <laughs> A really fun thing to do here. Okay, let me explain half-elf real quick. So half-elves are born of, of humans and elves. Uh, you know, say you have a human dad, elven mom. Some of them are often raised in the separate societies. Like I said, generally the, the races don't mingle very much. Only in really like human settlements will you find a mixture of others, but rarely will you find humans hanging out in elf settlements. So it might be really cool for you to have an elf elf that is more in tune with its elven side because say it was raised in the elven community as opposed to the human community or vice versa you know the half elf was raised raised in a human town um and has more of the human traits than the elven traits what i really like with half elves is switching it up so like i said you're half human maybe you're half dwarf half elf i know i'm a madman or maybe you're half human, half halfling. Pretty wild, right? Personally, I would just keep these bonuses that you get. <laughs> or maybe if you are like a, you know, half elf, half dwarf, maybe you have like a three and six chance to find doors, and then maybe you can get like plus two against magic. Maybe if you're a referee, think about that. You know, change it up a little bit. But half elves is written. You get the four and six chance, and you can see doors. Uh, in seeing doors, and you can see in the dark, 60 feet. They're very similar to elves in this game. Very, very similar to elves. Here's the difference. Half-elves may be fighters, magic users, or you can be a fighter, magic user, cleric. Ooh. So here we go. We finally have clerics unlocked in the multi-classing. Half-elves do have restrictions on maximum levels. A half-elf can reach level six as fighter, or more if you have higher, and can reach six level as magic user, or more if you have higher intel intellect. Half elves are limited to level four as clerics. That's not getting any better. <laughs> half elves may also be thieves, single class only, and may not pursue any other single classes such as as fighter or magic user. As a thieves, they can advance with no li without limit. Um, so basically, the difference between half elves and elves is the cleric thrown in there. You can get to up to level four in cleric. So if you're thinking about playing maybe a cleric. But the others interest you. Maybe you do a multi-class as a half-elf. Kind of fun. Kind of cool. Take a sip of water. Since we're about halfway through. A little bit more than halfway through. Halflings, yay. 
Halflings gain plus four in saving throws against magic. And have a plus one bonus when using missile weapons. Kind of comes from their small, you know, jump around quickly mentality. Oh, right. Halflings, obviously. Uh, they're prairie folk. Um, halflings are generally very happy, happy individuals. Anyone who has seen the Hobbit or the Lord of the Rings knows that there are some hobbits that are very optimistic uh, beings that are very joyful. Uh, however, yeah, there's some negative hobbits <laughs> and halflings um, that are sort of grouches, but you get that in any society. The majority of the halflings, though, I would play them you know, as joyful, spirit, spiritual folk that always sort of bring the shining light to any situation. Um, it even says here they're generally non-aggressive in nature, which is limiting them to only four levels of fighter, obviously because their size kind of comes into the <laughs> fact is that as well. Uh, they may also choose to be thieves, which in this case, there's no level limit on them. A lot of people decide to play halfling thieves because they're sort of small, you know, sneaky folk um, that also get a plus one bonus to when using missile weapons. So instead of getting up there in combat as a thief, you can stand back with a bow um, or any other missile and, and sort of fire in when you're not doing your thieving stuff like listening at doors. Humans are the default race of swords and wizardry. Uh, humans are humans. Everyone knows what <laughs> humans are. They don't give any bonus or penalties. Um, humans are hardy, 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 bleh, a hardy breed. There we go. Um, they can be the highest of high, the lowest of low. So they can either be the most faithful in their faith, most holy, or they can be the, the most evil. Um, you know, that's really in any fantasy world or our world is unfortunately it is. Note that non-humans cannot be assassins, druids, monks, paladins, or rangers as a player character. So humans unlock you to everything. You don't get any of those bonus or, or negatives attached to you because you can be any of the, the classes that I went over earlier. So multi-classing. You're asking me, Ben. When you said half-elves, you, you said they can be fighters slash magic users slash clerics. That does not mean they can be fighters or magic users or clerics. It means they can be a combination of all three, which is super cool. I really like multi-classing. So multi-classing is, is when you take um, and, and mash together the specifics of those classes. You're still going to gain all the benefits from being that class. However, you're more than one class at the same time. Super cool. Um, basically, you know, it's another incentive to playing a uh, race, uh, a non-human race, rather. Uh, halflings and human characters may only have a single class, so you can't multi-class with any of those. However, you can still dual class. So if you're playing your human fighter and you say, wow, at a higher level, I really want to be that thief, you can do the dual classing that we talked about earlier. Now, I know all of this can be a little confusing, so I want to remind you again, if you go over to the Frog God Games website, froggodgames.com, you can download Swords and Wizardry, the PDF, for absolutely free. So you can take your own time and read through this and really digest it. Ask me a question in the comments section, all that kind of stuff. Or you can buy the hardcover book for $35 and, you know, um, uh, have, a, you know have a physical copy of it as well. I know I always like having physical copies. Uh, hit dice. Multi-class characters begin with a single hit die. Uh, each multi-class hit die is calculated by rolling the appropriate die for each class and averaging the result. A multi-class character is limited to total nine hit dice. You only get nine hit dice if you're multi-classing. And past that, you only get one hit point per additional level. Abilities and limitations. Basically, you're limited in what you can specifically do. So say you're a fighter thief. You can do your thieving skills, but only nothing heavier than leather. So this way you're not, you know, hiding in the shadows with clunky metal armor on, you know, plate armor on. You can still only wear the leather if you're doing your thieving abilities. Make sure to keep that in mind. In addition, elves or half-elves cannot cast spells while wearing non-magical armor. So say you're playing, you know, that, that fighter magic user. Uh, you can't have plate armor while trying to cast spells. Although magic armor does not inhibit spell casting. So say you have magical plate armor or something, or magical armor of any other, you can still cast your spells, which is really cool. Make sure to keep those limitations in mind. A note to referees out there listening, you can make up your own limitations as you please. Um, you know, there's not, there's quite literally only these two limitations noted. So if you think that you want to play with a different limitation, go right on ahead and add it in. 
um, saving throws. Uh, basically, this long paragraph says um, pick the best available saving throw depending on your class and then make sure to add in any bonuses you get. So if you're an elf or a dwarf or a halfling, you get those bonuses. Um, or, or rather, magic users. Um, any you know race class bonuses that you get, make sure to add those in to the best available from the choices. Make sure it's the best available from the from the choices. You earn that as being multi-class. Experience points. You're saying, Ben, I have two classes. How am I going to divide experience between them? Any experience point received are evenly divided among all the classes. So say you're playing that fighter magic user and you gain 300 experience from a fight. 150 experience goes into fighter, 150 goes into magic user. You divide it between the two. And that'll make more sense as we go into classes. This will all come full circle. I know it can be a little confusing, but it's hard to talk about everything at once. Level advancement is, is basically what I just talked about. Um, what this specifically talks about is how you get new health hit points from leveling up. So what you do, say you're playing that, uh, say we're now we're playing a, a Dwarven Fighter Thief. In Swords and Wizardry, there's different experience points needed to gain a level in Fighter and Thief. It's not the same exact amount of experience points. So say you level up first as a Thief, but you're not level 2 as a Fighter yet. Say you're level 2 Thief and 1 Fighter and you need another 500, whatever, 500 experience to level up as a fighter. You don't gain your new hit points until you gain the level in both classes. You don't gain the new hit points until you gain a level in both classes. So you have to be level 2 on each to get new hit points. At that point, you would roll a D8 and a D4 and average the result. An easier way to think of that is roll your D8 and D4 and divide them each by two and then add that those two numbers together. So say I roll my D8 here and I get a six. Divide that by two, that's three. I roll my D4, I get a four. Divide that by two, that's two. I get five hit points because it's three and two. Average them, divide them by two. So it's a lot easier to do it. Also make sure to add in any constitution bonuses that you get as well. That's very important. Where are we at, 25 minutes? We'll wrap up video there. Actually, yeah, we'll wrap up the video there. I kind of rambled a little bit as well. <laughs> so in the long run, there's a lot of races that you can pick. I wanted to talk about race first because I really do believe that you should pick your race because you enjoy playing it, not for any specific bonuses. So if you really say, wow, I want to play a dwarf and get drunk and rage all the time and talk about my mountain, play dwarf. If you want to play a halfling because you want to play a really nice character, play a halfling. Always remember that no matter what race you pick, there are deviations to every race. So not every dwarf is the same. Not every elf is the same. Not every halfling is the same. Not every human is the same. It's very possible that a halfling, a halfling grew up in an elven culture and they act more like elves. Or, you know, they think they are an elf. Or that. So those, characters like that can be really fun. Hi, cat. Yes, I know. I'm aware of your presence. Hello. Okay. All right. <laughs> If you have any questions, make sure to let me know in the comment section down below, and I'd be happy to answer them. I know it's a lot to digest for new players. Um, but if you have anything else in the Swords and Wizardry Complete that you want me to talk about, please also leave that down in the comment section down below. Leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it at any time. That seriously helps me out a lot with growing the channel. And also subscribe if you are not already, because I'm going to be doing a full series on Swords and Wizardry, teaching you all the aspects of the game. That's it for me today. Keep those roles and spirits high, and we will see you next time.